Welcome everybody to the 2020 FPWR Virtual Family Conference presented by Levo Therapeutics. Before we begin today's presentation, let's first thank our amazing sponsors, Levo Therapeutics, Seleno Therapeutics, Harmony Biosciences, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, Saniona, and Novo Nordisk. Their support has allowed us to make this conference free for all of our community members, and we are incredibly grateful for their contributions. In today's clinical trials panel, our presenters will review the drug development process, the landscape of drug development for Prader-Willi syndrome, and will provide you with participation information on three clinical trials that are currently recruiting or will soon be recruiting participants. Without further ado, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Teresa Strong, who will give a brief overview of the drug development process. Enjoy the presentation. Thanks so much, Susan, and it's great to be with everybody this morning. Uh, I'm really thrilled to talk about clinical trials, which uh, is a favorite topic of mine. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the clinical trial process uh, to, to set the stage for the other speakers who will talk about their specific uh, clinical studies. So if we look from left to right here, this is the uh, drug development process beginning with discovery and then the preclinical steps. The preclinical steps is usually testing a, a drug in animal models to get a sense of safety and efficacy. We then move into the clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three, and that's what you'll be hearing a lot about this week until we get an approved FDA drug. And then uh, we have that, uh, application of that drug to the population. So next slide, Susan. Um, so just to review briefly the difference between phase one, two, and three. So phase one is the initial um, administration of the drug to the human population. So sometimes called a first in human study. And really it's done on a small number of typically healthy individuals, um, just to take a look at the safety profile and make sure that it matches uh, what the expectations are. If all of that looks good, we move to a phase two, and that in the, a rare disease space is usually 10 to 50 or 60 individuals, so, so relatively small still. And it's the first look at whether the drug is doing what you think it should be doing with respect to efficacy. So is it, is it having the effect? How, does it, how is it moving through the body? How is it secreted from the body? All of those questions are typically asked in a phase two. If all of that comes out as expected, we move to a phase three. And that is typically a comparison of the drug to a placebo control. In a PWS population, it would be on the order of maybe 100 or 150 participants. And the idea is really to establish, these are sometimes called pivotal trials, because the point is to establish that the drug is safe and effective for the, um, for, for the reasons um, that it's being uh, tried. So it also includes a longer exposure to the drug to get an idea about the long-term effects. Um, and it, it will compare, if there is a standard of care, it will compare to standard of care. In PWS, for most of our symptoms, we don't even have any treatment, so we don't have that comparison to make. And it has to reach a predetermined endpoint. So ahead of time, you have to talk with the FDA. You have to say, we think it's going to reduce hunger or it's going to reduce anxiety by this amount. So um, next slide, please. Um, what happens, oops, if we go back one. What happens after a phase three trial? Well, Levo and Selena will talk with you a little bit more about this today. But if the company speaks with the FDA and it looks like um, it's time to submit what's called an NDA, a new drug application, they'll pull together all of the information from all of the from the preclinical phase one, two, and three all together and submit it to the FDA and ask for approval of that drug. The FDA has a particular rubric uh, by which it evaluates drugs and really they're looking to see if the benefit outweighs the risk. So we know every drug out there has some risk. Um, and the question here is, are the risks reasonable and controllable and, and does the benefit outweigh those? And that's where FPWR has put a lot of effort uh, in collaboration with the members of the Clinical Trial Consortium is to educate the FDA about what the impact of PWS is, what the unmet medical needs, so they have the information they need to be able to make that benefit risk assessment. 
they also, the FDA will also look at, you know, the drug manufacturing process and make sure that's okay. They'll look at um, how the company intends to label and uh, determine whether that is uh, acceptable to them as well. Um, typically, they'll have a public hearing and uh, they may have um, a, a, an advisory panel that weighs in on whether the drug can be approved. Um, and the FDA approval is just an approval that the drug can be used. They don't have a say in the pricing and the, uh, the access to uh, insurance. So that's another step that um, we hopefully will have to be uh, dealing with soon. So next slide. So one of the biggest challenges in clinical trials is actually getting the trial done. So the only way we are gonna find out if these drugs are safe and effective in our PWS population is to uh, participate in clinical trials and um, you know, help in that process. So next slide, but it is, you know, it's a big decision for a family to make whether to participate in a clinical trial. There are definitely some advantages, right? So you have early access to a potentially effective drug that is treating uh, one of the difficult uh, symptoms in PWS. And as uh, families who have participated, for example, in the LEVO trial and in the Salino trial know, you have the option typically after the trial to continue on the drug until the uh, approval process is completed. Oftentimes these drug trials are done at uh, expert centers of care and so our kids get really good care when they're uh, being seen in a clinical trial. Uh, typically, the travel costs are covered, so uh, there's not a financial outlay uh, from the family. And really, it is the only way um, that we as a community learn whether a drug is going to work in our kids. But of course, there's risks uh, and, and uh, challenges. You know, it, it does take a significant investment of time, so it's important to understand what that time commitment is up front. The drug may not work, so you may go through all that trouble and then the drug doesn't work. Um, and we may not know the full risks uh, of, of the drug at the beginning of a clinical trial. So next slide. Um, but there are a lot of layers of protection for uh, participants in clinical trials. The FDA reviews all of the safety data before they allow a trial to move forward. The study investigator, that's the physician at the site, will get all the information from the company and um, should know that information really well and will help you understand that information. There's an institutional re review board at the site that will independently review and uh, determine if the study should go forward. And then most of these studies also have a data, data safety monitoring board, which is an independent group of experts who monitor the trial and um, you know, can, can, if they uh, detect any concerning signs, they can ask for the trial to be paused. So next slide. So, you know, it comes down to this question of should I enroll my loved one uh, with PWS in a clinical trial? And of course, only you can determine that. Um, but what we, we would ask you to do is to learn about the trials that you might be eligible for and consider whether, um, whether to enroll. So uh, I'm going to show you some uh, places to get information, but take a look at that information, speak with your personal physician, and speak with the on-site study team. So where are the trials gonna be done? The study coordinator can help you answer questions like what are the logistics? How long are the visits? How many times will I be coming in? And then the physician who is the principal investigator at the site can work with you so to make sure that you understand all of the potential risks and benefits, what they're gonna be looking for, what you should be looking for. And then finally, you know, you'll, you'll pull all that information together and, and, and of course make the decision and that's right for you. So next slide. Um, there are some great resources in considering, I would encourage you to write down all the questions that you have about a clinical trial and, and we'll share these resources that can help you put together that question list that you can ask when you're learning about a clinical trial. Um, so there's multiple resources and educational uh, videos. And on the next slide, FPWR also has on their clinical trial website, uh, a lot of information that you may find helpful. So we have a list of the clinical trials that are ongoing and you can click on each one and learn about them. Uh, we show you where they are on the map. Um, we have some downloadable questions and answers and videos. And you can also sign up for the clinical trial alert, which comes out periodically and updates you about the clinical trials that are ongoing. Next slide. 
Um, so this is the, and, and this is not even a complete list, but this is a list of the drugs that are currently uh, in clinical trials or about to be in clinical trials in PWS. And as you can see, it is a very busy slide, which is fantastic. I mean, honestly, 10 years ago, I would never have imagined that we would have this many things ongoing in PWS. And it's really a joy to see all of this activity. Um, so uh, just focusing on a couple of them, uh, up top you see the ones that are in earlier stage. Uh, there are multiple companies that are currently in preclinical developing molecules that may be um, applicable to PWS. I'll mention a couple of them. Beryl and uh, Lapidio are, are two companies, whoops, are two companies that um, uh, have preclinical molecules that FPWR has made venture philanthropy investments in. Barrel, a molecule that may uh, help strengthen bones in PWS, and Lapidio, a molecule to reduce uh, fat mass. Uh, we heard last week from Conscience, which uh, reported on their phase one uh, results for their molecule, CSTI 500. So they did that in healthy humans and are looking to move into phase two in PWS. I'll talk about Inversago in a second, but wanted to also mention uh, oxytocin, which has been, of course, uh, uh, trialed in our community over the last couple of years at academic centers. Uh, Dr. Hollander's got a study going on that. And the company OT4B, which is uh, based in France, is looking specifically at oxytocin in infants with PWS. Next slide. Um, the company Inversago is another company that, um, you know, the molecule that they're developing for PWS is one that we've been following for quite some time. So back in 2013, uh, we supported uh, Yossi Tam, who was in an academic lab at the NIH, looking at this molecule, which impacts the endocannabinoid system, which is known to be disrupted in PWS. So we supported some early stage work on that. And then the company Inversago was formed and, and got rights to that molecule. And we supported some of their early preclinical work. Well, they've now gotten venture capital uh, funds that is allowing them to move into phase one studies. So they have the phase one in healthy humans ongoing. And um, if that looks good, they are planning to move into PWS by the end of next year. So we're excited about that among, among the many other things. So next slide. Susan already mentioned the uh, return of results that you'll hear uh, today for Levo and Salino tomorrow. Just wanted to mention there was another phase three clinical trial that Melendo Therapeutics did this year, uh, last year and this year. Um, levolatide. Unfortunately, that drug did not seem to uh, have efficacy in our population, which of course is disappointing. But you know, it really is important and. Uh, the good news about that study is it was very well conducted and I think it's it is important to get answers that are no as well because they help guide us they give us information about what will and will not work in PWS and so we are very appreciative to Melendo for running that trial and for the families who participated in that trial. So today we'll um, next slide final slide um, we'll be hearing, as Susan said, from Dr. Hollander, we're, uh, uh, Dean Carson from San Iona, uh, and also Deepan Singh uh, talking about guamfacine. Now, guamfacine is different than the rest of the drugs on the slide in that it's already approved, and the study is really to look at how this approved drug might be applicable to the PWS population. So I'll stop there so that we can get to our other speakers today who I know you're excited to hear. So Teresa, we do have a question that came in, which is how long does it typically take the FDA to approve um, or go through the approval process once an application has been submitted to them? Okay, so I have to give a shout out to Ian Hassan who sent me an email yesterday because there was a similar question yesterday and I, I said uh, 12 to 18 months and I believe it's more on the order of 10 months, particularly uh, in rare disease. So, um, so it could be longer than that, but um, should be, a, you know, 10 months to a year from the submission. Uh, and, and, you know, I think Salino and Levo will both, um, you know, they, they won't want to give an exact timeline, but they may be able to give a general timeline for their particular drugs. 
Fantastic. And as far as oxytocin, um, is that study only based in France or is there a U.S. study as well? I believe it's ongoing in uh, more than France in, in several European countries. Uh, there is not to my knowledge a um, current study in the U.S. Um, however, you know, these companies are always looking to next steps. And so I think for, uh, I, I think we should, you know, see, see what happens over the, you know, the, the coming year or two. Sure. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, our next presenter is going to be Dr. Singh. He's going to be presenting on guanfacine. If you um, attended his session yesterday, um, he talked a lot about anxiety in this particular drug. Um, so if you're coming back today, this is the time when you're going to get to hear specifically about uh, guanfacine. And I expect that we will have a number of questions for you. So Dr. Singh, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you so much, Susan. It was a lot of fun yesterday speaking with uh, my camera um, and imagining 200 people sitting behind that. Um, but it was, I've uh, got a lot of uh, enthusiastic emails after that, not just about guanfacine, but about anxiety and other um, issues in uh, in um, uh, Prada Willi syndrome when it comes to um, behavioral issues. So, uh, but today we have limited time. Um, so we're going to talk. We're going to focus on uh, on the clinical trial. I'm very grateful uh, to Dr. Hedstrom and uh, the team at FBWR for trusting me with uh, this clinical study. Uh, as Dr. Strong introduced earlier. Um, this is not an like quote unquote experimental novel um, molecule. It's been around for uh, a long time. It's FDA approved for the treatment of uh, ADHD. And it has also been studied in other populations such as autism. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is just an introductory slide. Okay, and so to, uh, I'm gonna jump right into guanfacine. Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, it is well known that our patients with Prader-Willi syndrome and our loved ones with Prader-Willi syndrome have um, a higher likelihood of having ADHD, um, autism spectrum symptoms, and uh, there are a lot of commonalities uh, between the symptoms that they show across the board in Prader-Willi syndrome. And very often that will present with aggression, self-injurious behavior, skin picking. Um, and the common pathway amongst all of these symptoms that I'm describing is impulsivity, you know, poor impulse control. So people are, uh, so our patients are not being able to stop themselves and they've already done something which is harmful to themselves or to others. Uh, without really thinking about it. And this speaks of a deficiency in executive functioning, the planning part of our brain. Um, and studies um, have shown that, uh, imaging studies have shown that the part of the brain that controls the rest of the brain and helps us plan and stops us from doing something that is impulsive and can be potentially harmful, that is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the front of the brain. And that part of the brain is not functioning well enough and the volume is lesser, it's smaller in patients with Prader-Willi syndrome. So, so uh, in my early work with Prader-Willi syndrome, like six and a half, almost seven years ago, I uh, discovered that, uh, wait a second, we need to find a medicine that does not make all of these symptoms worse, does not cause weight gain and reduces impulsivity. And it was very hard to find one that would fit that all of these characteristics. And, and so I tried a medicine which is well known to work and has been FDA approved for many years for ADHD. And, and lo and behold, I had positive studies uh, and then I published um, a case report and then a case series. And since then I've seen many, many patients and many of them have benefited from guanfacine extended release. So why should we, so uh, as you can see, it's an alpha-2 um, agonist, which means that the, the flight or fright uh, response that, is, that comes up in our patients, um, and uh, usually with frivolous stimuli, so nothing bad has happened, but still they're reacting that way. That is mellowed, that is lessened by this medication. It increases activity 
in the part of the brain that promotes executive functioning, that's dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, it also uh, causes a sort of a, you know, pre, like it's not clinically relevant, but in laboratory studies, it has been shown to increase, elevate, uh, increase growth hormone levels. So I'm not sure whether that plays a part in behavioral symptoms, um, you know, uh, by giving guanfacine, but that, that was an interesting finding. Um, and it, is, uh, it has been shown to reduce ADHD and impulsiveness in autism, which is also commonly comorbid. Uh, those symptoms are commonly comorbid in patients with PWS. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this just goes over the clinical, uh, the case series that I conducted, uh, which was the basis for this uh, grant from FUWR and the interest that I've seen in the, in the Paravili community from parents uh, and families. So it was, this was an early study, as you can imagine, quite a few years ago, um, but we published findings from 27 individuals, consecutive individuals that we gave um, at varying dosages guanfacine extended release. And uh, these were ages six to 26 years of age. And uh, we noticed 81% uh, in a reduction in skin picking um, and 82% uh, uh, reduction in aggression and agitation and 93%, uh, 90, uh, almost 94% reduction in ADHD symptoms. Um, so this was uh, really heartening and uh, gave us the impetus to continue working on this. Next slide, please. So this study is going to be a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Uh, we, uh, our center is Maimonides Medical Center. Uh, it's in the heart of Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, you know, we have got lots of partners acro across the state and uh, in New Jersey as well. Now, the silver lining to this horrible pandemic has been the advent of telepsychiatry. So just to give you a sense, my practice right now is 100% telepsychiatry. All of my patients are being seen by video visits only, and they have found it really helpful because they were traveling hours upon hours to come see us. So we want to replicate, um, you know, we want to sort of see and, and sort of like demonstrate that what we are seeing in case series and what I'm seeing in, in my patients is not just by chance. So it's very important for you to join this study so that we can demonstrate to the scientific community, to psychiatrists and providers all across the world that there's this medicine, which is well known to be safe, has been around for a while, and you can start giving it today to your, uh, to your patients if they have uh, self-injury, aggression, self-harm, if they have, uh, and they have Prader-Willi syndrome. So we need to get started on this. Now, uh, going back to the issue with the uh, uh, video visits, we are planning that uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so we can, as you can see, the number of visits, as you can see, um, we have uh, the first visit, which is, uh, which is to sort of, uh, and we can actually randomize and in, on the first visit if uh, people don't have any uh, reasons to do a wash off, like a wash out period where we stop certain medicines, which kind of uh, fight with the guanfacine, but that would be rare because we'd be screening a lot of questions even on the phone. So it's very likely that you'll be ending up, you end up coming in for that first visit, then at week eight, and all of these other visits that we uh, week visit two, visit three, visit four, visit five, can actually be held via video because they don't require physical examination, okay? And we can provide you with, uh, we'll be providing you with blood pressure cups, uh, because that can occasionally happen, that you, you can monitor uh, their blood pressure. We'll teach you how to do that uh, at the time that you visit us for the first time. But otherwise, this medication is fairly well tolerated. And just by doing uh, the safety assessments and, uh, and assessments for uh, and the psychiatric medical evaluation over phone, uh, sorry, uh, over video, we can sort of uh, track your progress. And we are hoping that this will help encourage many of you, you're kind of like what kind of thinking about it, but they feel sort of strange about traveling to New York or coming to Brooklyn or, and you know, finding parking and stuff like that. I think at the end of it, there'll be three visits, three physical visits and the rest of them would be virtual. And that's really heartening. Um, so there are two phases to the study. The first phase is double-blind placebo-controlled, 
Um, and uh, the second phase is open label. And everyone would be, so after the first eight weeks, the remaining eight weeks of the study, so the ninth to 16th week, would be um, open label and they'll all, all of our patients will be on medication. Um, so we're really hopeful we need to recruit about 34, 35 patients at a minimum to really demonstrate that this medication actually does what we, what we are seeing in clinical practice. And I think that knowledge is gonna be really helpful. So I'm, uh, I'm sure there are other questions and I know uh, hopefully I'm within time. Um, Susan, let's see the next slide. I don't think there's anything else. I wanted to keep it brief. All right, very good. Now here's the information for Dr. Theresa Jacob. She is uh, she's my partner in this. She's our co-investigator. She's, um, she's got years of experience in research and she's the director of research for our department. Um, so uh, I hope you will pick up the phone and give her a call. Her number is right here on the screen. Um, and um, we are gonna start, we are in the IRB process right now, but as you know, this medicine has been around. It's not experimental. So we're gonna be starting probably at the end of the year, but I wanted to be conservative and I put in a January uh, start. So, uh, but please start expressing your interest now so that we can um, set you up and uh, we can give you more information. Thank you so much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you, Dr. Singh. We do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, the first one would be in regards to the washout. What medications would need to be washed out um, prior to the study? Okay, so the ones uh, which would definitely need to be washed out would be the short-acting forms of uh, similar medicines. Like if, if your child is on clonidine or guanfacine, the short-acting form, uh, then they should be washed off. If you've been on uh, Intuna, which is a brand name for guanfacine extended release, uh, already and you've had you know negative uh, results from it then it's not even washing out we, we, we probably not you will probably not be a good candidate for the study however if you've been on very many patients don't uh, they think that Intunif doesn't work because they've been on like one two milligrams really low dosages and then they kind of gave up on it so if you're one of those people who are listening and you're like oh, I tried Intunif didn't work for me you should give us a call because you, you we might be missing something uh, otherwise, if you've been stable on the same medicines for a lo long time, like suppose if, if someone is on Risperdal or lithium, if you've been stable for a long time, I will personally be doing that first interview for all of these patients. So I want to make sure that this, you know, safe and, you know, I'm not going to mess with medicines that are helping you, but at the same time on a case by case basis, if we see that something is like potentially harming you or going to interfere with the trial, we'll stop it. But other than you being on medicines which are very similar to guanfacine, uh, but they're short acting, other than stopping those, we don't see much reason for wash up for most medicines. Okay, so we've got a number of um, questions and perhaps you already answered it, but they're, they're asking if they're already on guanfacine, can they participate in this study? If they wanna participate in this study, what do they need to do? Yeah, so um, uh, exactly. I mean, I, I think I tried to answer something similar in the uh, in the past. But many patients come to me while being on guanfacine, but they just haven't been in like a trial where we can try it out well. Now, you will probably, if you're on uh, guanfacine, just because you might be randomized to placebo, you will have to go through that three week wash off um, before we start you on the active or placebo medication. Uh, but other than that, um, I think it should not discourage you from calling, especially if you have the symptoms continuing of aggression and self-injury. However, if you're at high dosages, I would say if you're, uh, you know, on three, four, five, you know, milligrams, I would, uh, of intune the extended release, not the short, if you're on short acting guanfacine, that's not a limiting, limiting factor at all. Definitely give us a call. If you've been on high dosages of long-acting guanfacine, which is the study, which is what we're studying, and you haven't found that helpful, then this is probably not going to be, uh, it's not going to be helpful for you to join the study. But still give us a call, we'll guide you. Okay. Um, the next question is in regards to blood pressure. So um, one of the side effects could be the lowering of blood pressure, which could be a benefit if you have high blood pressure already. What's the likelihood, like how much of a decrease would one expect with this drug? 
So guanfacine is a horrible blood pressure controlling medicine, right? So it was, it, it was, it's okay for high blood pressure, uh, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not a very strong medicine by any uh, stretch of imagination. The, uh, we will still give you a blood pressure cuff, especially if you're not uh, in the New York area, just to make it convenient for you. Uh, but in my practice, my clinical practice, if you're increasing it gradually or going down gradually, then the blood pressure fluctuations are not significant at all. And uh, most, uh, like uh, for example, the psych psychiatric associations do not really recommend, they just recommend sort of um, occasional monitoring and symptom triggered monitoring. So we'll tell you what kind of symptoms to look out for if the blood pressure is fluctuating, in which case we'll monitor it more closely. Otherwise, it's not. It's important to not stop the medicine suddenly. So if you, uh, you know, because uh, if you're on the higher dosages and you stop the medicine suddenly, your blood pressure might fluctuate. But other than that, it is pretty well tolerated. I don't know if I answered the question though, did I? Yes, I, I, okay. I, I believe that you answered the question. It wasn't my question. Um, but, but, uh, thank you so much for answering those questions. Again, Dr. Singh will be available at the end of the presentation. So if there's a few more questions, we can get to them then. In the meantime, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who's going to be Dean Carson, coming to us from Saniona, and he will be discussing Saniona's plan phase two study of Testament. So if, um, Dean, if you're there, there you are. The stage is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dean Carson. I am Vice President of Scientific Affairs with Saniona. Um, we are, uh, I'm based in Boston, um, but our company is actually currently headquartered in, in Copenhagen. So um, we're kind of, you know, across the pond there. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm a neuropharmacologist by training. I did my PhD at the University of Sydney. And then I did my postdoctoral training in pediatric psychopharmacology at Stanford. Uh, and, and then I left academia and have been working in industry developing uh, drugs for various different conditions, but have had uh, a, an interest in rare disease um, over the last five years. And I've actually been involved with the, the Prader-Willi syndrome community for about four or five years. So I uh, have been a member of the clinical trials consortium that uh, Teresa mentioned before, and that's been great to be involved with, with other companies and academics and talking about how do we improve uh, drug development and identification of, um, of uh, new therapies for people that have Prader-Willi syndrome? Um, I'm going to be talking today about the work that we've been doing on a drug called Tessimet in Prader-Willi syndrome. And I will present some of our current clinical trial data and also talk a little bit about the proposed clinical trial we have upcoming as well. Uh, next slide. So we are a publicly traded company. So um, I have to present this slide just as a disclosure uh, whenever we're talking about data or anything that we might uh, be having come up in the future. Uh, next slide. So on this slide, I'm gonna talk about Tessimet and, and what it is. So Tessimet is actually the combination of, of uh, parts of two different words. One is tessafentine and the other is metoprolol. So it is two drugs combined to create the tesamet uh, compound. And tesafentine is a triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor that controls eating. So the, uh, you, you've probably heard before in some context about the neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. Um, and they're involved in a multitude of different behavioral and physiological processes. In this case, what we're uh, interested in is the role of those three neurotransmitters in reducing hyperphagia and controlling uh, craving for food and appetite, as well as increasing metabolic activity. Now, the increase in metabolic activity is uh, in part uh, driven by the, the noradrenaline increases that we get with tesafentine. Um, and that's really important. It's, a, it's an important aspect of how this drug works in controlling uh, body weight, especially. Uh, but what you also get is uh, at various different higher doses an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. So the, that's where the addition of metoprolol comes in, which is a beta blocker. And it's, uh, it's used there in combination with tesafentine to offset some of those cardiovascular effects that you might get in some patients and at, and at higher doses. So it's essentially now a cardiovascular neutral compound that's still having those effects in the brain 
that we're interested in, in controlling hyperphagia and body weight as well. Um, next slide. So this slide gives you an overview of the completed phase 2A clinical trial that we conducted in Prader-Willi syndrome. So that was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled phase 2A proof-of-concept clinical trial. And I know that's a lot of information, but with the, the um, wonderful presentation that Teresa gave, I, I hope that that gives some kind of clarity as to where we are uh, in the drug development process. So this is, this is the first time uh, that Tessamet had been tested in that patient population. And then we take the data from there and kind of move into planning what the, the next stages are. So I'll go through the initial proof of concept clinical trial data and then talk toward the end a little bit about what our plans are going forward. Uh, but this study was conducted in two centers. It was actually outside of the US. It was in the Czech Republic and Hungary. Um, and we recruited adult subjects, just a small number of patients, so nine um, adults were enrolled first. And then after we learned how the drug impacted the adults with Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, we went about recruiting adolescents with Prader-Willi syndrome. And again, just a small uh, number, nine participants for the adolescents. The primary efficacy endpoint was change in body weight from baseline to week 12. And the secondary efficacy endpoint was changing hyperphagia from baseline to week 12. Um, so you can see kind of maybe a little bit of a confusing figure um, on this screen, and I'll try and break it down. So the, the adult patients were first treated with uh, either Tessamet at 0.5 milligrams or placebo uh, and for three months. And then, you know, we compared the, the difference in their hyperphagia and their body weight levels from the start to the finish of that treatment period. Uh, now, what we learned in that study um, helped us with our decision making of dose selection for the adolescent patients. So again, it was the same thing. It was um, uh, adolescent patients with Prader-Willi syndrome were treated with Tessamet at the 0.125 milligram dose or placebo for three months. And we compared the change in hyperphagia and body weight from start to finish of treatment. In the adolescence though, we had an open label extension built into the protocol where patients could continue on if they liked to continue taking the, uh, the Tessamet dose that they had received or if they were on placebo to now have the opportunity to take Tessamet. And we actually modified the protocol, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in the next couple of slides to increase the dose in a second open label extension to 0.25 milligrams. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the data uh, for the adults after uh, 90 days of treatment. Um, and so what you see on the left-hand side is that the 0.5 milligram dose of Tessamet resulted in a clinically meaningful body weight reduction. So it was greater than 5% uh, of the body weight was uh, lost in the adult patients after 90 days of treatment. On the right-hand side, what you see is that Tessamet at 0.5 milligrams resulted in statistically significant and clinically meaningful reductions in hyperphagia. And again, that was quite a robust uh, reduction. It was actually over eight points um, from start to uh, finish of treatment there. So uh, very impressive data here in the adults at that uh, 0.5 milligram dose. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there were some surprising things that we learned. Um, and so first of all, uh, we have had experience with tesafencine in previous studies in general obese um, uh, adult patients. And what we found in the Prader-Willi syndrome patients was that there were two to three times higher than expected plasma concentrations of tesafencine compared to what we'd seen in those previous studies. And we know in those previous studies that it's between eight and 12 micrograms per liter um, of tesafencine in the blood, oops, um, that drives the body weight reduction in the general obese population. Now, uh, it probably doesn't come as too much of a, a, a surprise if you have had experience um, with, uh, you know, in Prader-Willi syndrome with having to decide on what's an appropriate dose of other drugs that might be metabolized uh, differently in Prader-Willi syndrome. So we know that in Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, even if the BMI is comparable to an unaffected sibling, that those um, two individuals will have a very different body weight composition. So for example, 
those with Prader Willi syndrome typically have higher fat mass and lower lean muscle mass, and their bone density might also be slightly different as well. So this can drive uh, a, a difference in metabolism of drugs uh, such as tetrafenthine. Now, what we saw, um, likely driven by the higher than expected uh, um, blood levels of the drug, was that there were an increase in adverse events. They were mostly psychiatric. Um, they, in, they included things such as insomnia, hallucination, and affect lability, which is just kind of mood going up and down. Um, importantly, though, it's, it is um, critical to understand what pre-existing psychiatric and central nervous system issues that individuals in a clinical trial experience, especially those with Prader-Willi syndrome, which as um, all of you uh, are likely familiar, it's not uncommon for people with Prader-Willi syndrome to have comorbid psychiatric problems. And so um, if there are higher than expected levels of a drug accumulating in those individuals, it could be driving an increase in, in some of the psychiatric symptoms. So that's something that we've certainly taken into consideration and, and planning for and um, coordinating future studies. Um, there were no clinically meaningful differences in heart rate or blood pressure, which goes back to what I was talking about, about the addition of metoprolol to, to create a cardiovascular neutral compound. So that was good. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the adolescent um, patients. And so you saw on, on one of the previous slides with the, the flow chart of what the study looked like, there was um, a decision based on the fact that we saw higher than expected plasma levels of the drug in the adults. There was a decision to um, uh, utilize a, a much lower dose in the adolescent patients. That's why we chose the 0.125 milligram dose in the adolescents. Um, unfortunately, that yielded plasma levels of tetrafenthine that were lower than the predicted target concentrations that I also mentioned, the 8 to 12 micrograms per liter. Um, as per previous experience with this drug in the general obese population. Um, so there, there wasn't an impact on, on reducing body weight or hyperphagia uh, at that dose. Um, I also mentioned that in the second open label extension, we increased the dose to 0.25 milligrams. Um, and what we found at that higher dose was that now we're starting to get closer to the expected um, effective concentrations of the drug in the, in the blood of these individuals. And that did result in a reduction in body weight, but we didn't see any impact on hyperphagia scores. Now, there are a few um, complicating factors uh, between the, ad the adults and the adolescent patients that need to be considered, and are certainly things that we are factoring in going forward. And that is that uh, body weight is kind of a tough measure when you're talking about adolescents because you've got a growing um, population, so they can be growing up and they can be growing out in all sorts of different ways. So using a standardized score of, of the body mass index um, for adolescents so we can understand you know, how the changes in body weight compare to what would be expected for, for, uh, for other people within their age group is going to be important. And of course, I think everybody knows this, that hyperphagia scores are highly variable in adolescents. And that's something that we are also considering is kind of looking at how do we control for that in future studies to make sure that we can get a good read on how this drug is impacting on hyperphagia in adolescents with Prader-Willi syndrome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, kind of similar to, but in a much milder fashion, the adverse events related to Tessamet in the adolescent patients were mostly psychiatric. Uh, next slide, Susan. So here's an overview of what the future study um, might look like. And as Teresa pointed out, you know, this, there, there is a process of going through discussing with FDA, um, all, you know, all of the risks and all of the benefits that are expected in, in a new drug. Um, and taking that to, to FDA to have discussions is kind of the, the stage that we're at. So it's called a, a pre-IND phase or a pre-investigational new drug phase before being able to uh, move forward with recruiting patients. Um, but the way that we've been uh, looking at the design of this study is that we would have a 16 week double blind period. That's, uh, that's about a month longer than what we had, had done previously. Uh, it of course will be placebo controlled. 
uh, and then likely to have some sort of open label extension where those that were on um, maybe one of the lower doses or that were randomized to placebo would have the opportunity to uh, to to um, to go into the active treatment. Uh, the primary efficacy endpoint is just switched from what we did before, and I think everybody knows that um, you know most people um, developing drugs these days uh, in Prader Willi syndrome are looking at hyperphagia, and that um, in in many patients body weight might be a secondary concern to hyperphagia. So this has been switched. So the primary efficacy endpoint is change in hyperphagia from baseline to week 16, um, and uh, the proposed secondary efficacy endpoint is change in body weight from baseline to week 16. And now we're testing three different doses here. So as I mentioned, that 0.5 milligram dose was leading to higher than expected uh, blood levels of the drug. So we're, we're not utilizing that dose here, but we've got the 0 0.125, 0 0.25 and 0.375 milligram doses compared to placebo. Uh, next slide. Okay, and here's a summary of the proposed um, study population that we'd be studying um, uh, going forward. And these are the key inclusion and exclusion criteria. So um, we'll be aiming to recruit males and females. Uh, they'll need to have a confirmed genetic diagnosis of prader willi syndrome, including determination of genetic subtype. Um, adolescents and, uh, and adults will be recruited. So from ages 12 to 65 years. Uh, and the BMI, they need to be having a BMI uh, that would categorize them as being overweight or above. Um, and exclusion criteria that are important is that there needs, there can't be any evidence of, of having too high or too low blood pressure or too high or too low uh, heart rate either. And that just goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning, that both tesafensine and metoprolol um, can potentially have some impact on, on, uh, on those parameters, blood pressure and heart rate. Um, uh, of course, no known hypersensitivity to tesafensine or metoprolol. Uh, and importantly, because of the potential interaction of the, the mechanism of uh, tesafensine with other psychotropic drugs that might be used for controlling things like depression or anxiety, um, there will be an exclusion criteria that uh, individuals can't be on concomitant use of antidepressants or stimulants. So that would have to be um, washed out um, and, and removed as a treatment prior to somebody being able to be recruited into the planned study. Um, also, uh, there can't be use of any other agent for weight loss in the past three months or participation in any other interventional uh, trials within the last three months. And those things are just to ensure that there's no kind of con confounds with respect to understanding how Tessamet works in treating prader willi syndrome compared to the effects that might be experienced from those other agents. Um, I think that might be it if you go to the last slide. So um, because this study is, is not open for enrollment yet, um, there is limited information or additional information that I can provide or that Sendiona can provide on the study. Um, but we do have this, uh, this site here that you can go to. So um, if you want to you know, jot this down, I know it's probably not the easiest to, to quickly jot down, but um, I'm sure Teresa and Susan will provide that afterwards as well. And you can go and, and just register your interest in the study. And then that way, once we are ready to start uh, recruitment, the information will be there and we'll know uh, who to provide it to. Okay, and that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dean, for presenting on this study. Um, we will be sure to share that link with everybody so that they have an opportunity um, to look up any more information that they have. And um, just for the sake of time, we're going to go straight to our next speaker, which is going to be Dr. Eric Collender who will be talking with us today about his study um, on CBDV. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan and Teresa for inviting us to participate in this really extraordinary uh, panel. I'm learning a lot. So if I could have the first slide, please. I'm gonna be talking about uh, our study in uh, CBDV or cannabidivarin, which is a plant-based uh, cannabinoid compound compared to placebo. This is a study that's gonna be taking place both in children and in young adults up to the age of 30 with Prader-Willi syndrome. 
And I'd like to note that the study was funded by the Foundation for Prado Willy Research, as, as well as a grant from uh, GW uh, Pharma as well. So uh, CBDV uh, or cannabidivarin is a phytocannabinoid or it's a plant-based cannabinoid. Uh, so in um, marijuana, for example, there are lots of different uh, compounds uh, or cannabinoids and it, it, this affects different systems. Uh, within the body, there's an endocannabinoid system so that our brain produces these cannabinoid compounds and the receptors are throughout our central nervous system and also throughout our immune system. Um, and we think that the cannabinoids and in particular cannabidivarin or CBDV may exert its effects in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is by modifying this uh, excitation inhibition imbalance. If people have too much excitation, well, then they can have uh, temper tantrums, for example. They can be prone to seizures. Uh, they can have uh, uh, impulsive kind of behaviors like hyperphagia, for example. So there's a net imbalance between the uh, excitatory system, which is often linked to glutamate, and the inhibitory system, which is often linked to GABA. And uh, these cannabinoids may modulate this excitation inhibition uh, ratio or imbalance. One thing that it's important to recognize is that uh, CBDV is, is not CBD. So it's different than what you get over the counter, CBD or cannabidiol. And this is a compound also that doesn't include any uh, THC. The THC is the cannabinoid that gets you high that stimulates specific cannabinoid one and two receptors. CBDV does not. And it's also not a medical marijuana. So you're not using the whole plant with the THC. Here we've extracted one specific uh, component uh, or cannabinoid. So why do we think that uh, CBDV might be of some help in prado willi syndrome? Well, first is that CBDV has these uh, important anticonvulsant properties, and it's been studied in patients with epilepsy and refractory epilepsy, and, and has shown some uh, benefit that having uh, anticonvulsant effects uh, may be of benefit. Interestingly, it also has these anti-inflammatory properties, and one of the ideas across a range of different neurodevelopmental disorders is that the immune inflammatory system may be turned on and uh, therefore this is a compound that has anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, it also may have some antioxidative stress or neuroprotective effects, some uh, anti-anxiety effects and even anti-psychotic effects. Interestingly, some of these cannabinoids like CBDV also have uh, anti-addictive effects and uh, so you can think of the hyperphage or the compulsive eating as a, like a behavioral type of an addiction as well. So CBDV is clearly different from the CBD that you can get either over the counter or in a drugstore or online. First of all, CBDV is a, a regulated compound. So it has a IND. It's made under good manufacturing uh, uh, properties. So you know exactly what the composition and the amount of uh, different cannabinoids are uh, as opposed to these over-the-counter kind of CBD preparations that vary greatly in terms of, uh, you know, what else is found within the, uh, the uh, dose and uh, what's the uh, purity of it as well. Uh, one of the things is CBDV has been studied uh, in some conditions most notably uh, epilepsy. So we have some systematic data in terms of uh, side effects on it. And um, it, uh, GW Pharma um, is a company that has made uh, Epidiolex. Epidiolex is uh, currently marketed for two specific rare forms of epilepsy. One of them, for example, is Dravet syndrome as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what are we uh, looking at? What do we hope to see a change in in this particular trial? 
Um, our primary focus is on irritability. Uh, there is some evidence that the cannabinoids may have some nice effect in reducing irritability. And that includes things like uh, protest, temper tantrums. So if somebody is interrupted from having food or there's a uh, change in schedule, sometimes uh, children and adults can manifest with irritability. Uh, we think that CBDV or cannabidiverin may be particularly helpful. And we're measuring this by looking at the, the ABC or the Aberrant Behavior Checklist Irritability Scale. We're also looking at what impact uh, this uh, compound has on repetitive behaviors. We think repetitive behaviors is a very important component of Prader-Willi syndrome. And we're measuring that with the uh, RBSR, Repetitive Behavior Scale Revised, and the CY box scale. Uh, the cannabinoids also have shown some uh, positive effects on reducing appetite. So we're looking at the impact on hyperphagia using a same scale that's been used in other studies as well, the hyperphagia questionnaire CT. Uh, we're looking at the impact that this has on uh, behavioral rigidity and cognitive rigidity and protest using the uh, mers prada willi scale that uh, Bonnie Taylor and myself have developed as an outcome measure. And then finally, we're looking at uh, what impact this has on uh, global improvement as well, using the, the CGI improvement and the CSQ. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is a, as you heard, a phase two uh, study comparing the CBDV versus placebo. The irritability is the primary endpoint, but we're looking at these other endpoints, including repetitive behaviors and hyperphagia. We think that this cannabinoid may have some positive effects on sleep quality as well, and we're using an actigraph to be able to track the uh, any improvements that we see in sleep. We mentioned that we're looking at rigidity and global uh, features as well. And then one thing that we're very interested in uh, where there's a hint or a signal in some of the epilepsy uh, trials that have been done with this compound is whether or not there's any improvement in social communication. And we're measuring that using the ABC subscale, which is the social withdrawal or the lethargy scale. Uh, to look at whether or not we're getting improvement in what's called reciprocity or back and forth uh, communication. Next slide. So uh, the patients come in, they have a, a screening visit remotely, then they come into Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, and they have their baseline uh, study where they get a physical exam, uh, they get routine uh, blood work, they get all of the baseline assessments, and then they're randomized either to the cannabidivarin or placebo. This is a 12-week uh, treatment trial. Uh, after the 12 weeks, when then we uh, take people off of their uh, either active or placebo medicine and then follow them up two weeks later and see if there's any change when they come off of the, the, the medicine. Next slide. So this kind of uh, talks about what the uh, outcome measures are. I mentioned that this is kind of unique because we're studying uh, the effects in 36 children and young adults, so ranging from age five up to an age of 30. Unfortunately, there aren't very many studies available for young adults, and this is one. Originally, we got funding from the Foundation for Prada willi Research 24, but with additional funding from GW, we were able to uh, add an additional 12 subjects or a total of 36, which gives us a better sample size for a phase two trial. Uh, and then we'll also be doing some measures to look at uh, safety and look at uh, whether we have any uh, change or improvement in things like weight and uh, BMI, blood pressure, pulse, vital signs. Next slide. So potential side effects that have occurred in prior studies with the CBDV in other populations and also that have occurred uh, in another trial that we're doing with CBDV currently in children with autism spectrum disorder, which is uh, funded by the Department of Defense, 
Uh, there can be some mild gastrointestinal symptoms, a little bit of fatigue or drowsiness. There's been uh, noted to be a slight headache. But overall, uh, in our data, data safety monitoring committee, we haven't seen any serious adverse events and the side effects have been mostly mild and not associated with the study drug. Next slide. Is that the last slide? So I guess what I'm uh, saying is, uh, in addition to the study that we're currently doing with the intranasal oxytocin, which is funded by the Orphan Products Division of the Food and Drug Administration, we're very excited about uh, launching this new study with this uh, brand new cannabinoid treatment, CBDV. We're grateful uh, to the Foundation for Prada Willie Research for pro providing funding. We're also working with GW Pharma, which is the company has extracted this uh, compound from the uh, plant, and we're working carefully and closely with them as well. Uh, we think that this is a sort of a new uh, treatment approach uh, and that it can target uh, symptoms that haven't really been fully explored, like uh, irritability, for example, uh, repetitive behaviors, social reciprocity, and even eating behaviors. So thanks very much for your attention. And if there's any time, I'd be glad to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollander, for presenting on that study of CBDV. Um, I'm going through our list of questions. Will the participants that receive the placebo receive the CBDV treatment um, after? Um, no, it, this study doesn't have an open label uh, maintenance. So currently we're comparing the active to a placebo for 12 weeks and then we're seeing what happens also when they come off. But in this particular trial, we don't offer the open label maintenance. Okay. Um, how young, I, I'm not sure if this question is, is for the study. How long, how young would you start CBDV? Well, our trial starts at age five. So it goes from age five up to age 30. Uh, so that's, that's where we're studying it. Um, and we've studied it in individuals age five and above in our autism study as well. All right, and people are interested in participating, but they'd like a little bit more information on the locality of the study. Is this only taking place in New York and is uh, our visits required to New York for the study? All right, so it's occurring just at one site, which is at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is in the Bronx in New York City. Uh, we do have uh, funding from travel agencies that can uh, reimburse people for their uh, flight costs to come here. We've uh, worked on the protocol to decrease the number of visits. So half of the visits can now be done remotely where individuals can uh, have like a Zoom kind of look up, hook up, and then they can uh, speak with uh, our psychologist or our study doctor where we can do the ratings over, uh, over the web, for example, and people can get local uh, blood work as well. But uh, I believe that four or five of the visits will take place in New York. So we've tried to balance um, uh, feasibility and uh, decrease the overall burden on families, but we do require some visits in the New York area. Sure, and if someone's from Canada and can travel to New York, are they allowed to participate? Yeah, we don't, we don't have any exclusion for people who are coming from Canada. Um, we have some issues with regards to COVID. We've tried to, you know, decrease the overall number of visits and there are sort of high risk localities or states and low risk localities and states. So we're starting with people in the New York area and who are coming from states or localities where there's a low COVID risk right now. And hopefully as the pandemic dies down, then we'll be able to increase our recruitment from other sites. By the way, the last slide that we had was a recruitment slide. I don't know if it popped up, but people who are interested in participating can contact uh, Bonnie Taylor at uh, botaylor at montefiore.org uh, or phone her at 718-839-7530 or could contact Spectrum 
at montefiore.org. Great. And I did just post um, that information up on the slides, so I'll leave that up for folks who okay. want to take a note. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras on. We're going to go into open Q&A. So we'll be accepting questions to go out to any of the speakers. Um, and while we're waiting for the rest, oh, they're already there. Dr. Hollander, we did have a, at least one more question specific to CBDV. Um, how long do you expect to be recruiting for? And then when do you expect results to be ready? That's a good question. So our goal is to enroll uh, 36 subjects and we hope to uh, complete the study over a period of about 18 months. Hopefully we'll be having some results uh, maybe within two, two and a half years. All right. So, you know, nothing in clinical trials moves at, at the speed of light. It takes time to recruit patients, collect the data, analyze the data, and then, of course, submit any of those results to the FDA. Um, so, you know, Dr. Hollander, I think I heard you say two and a half years is what we could expect. That's pretty fast in the scheme of clinical trials. Um, and we thank you for, and your team, of course, for working to put this study together. Um, Dr. Singh, is guanfacine available in the UK? I know it would be outside of your study, but for our UK families, they were interested if that's something that's still available to them. Oh, that's a good question. I am uh, pretty certain that the short acting form of guanfacine is available. However, the efficacy, I mean, it's, it's hard. Uh, I don't use the short uh, acting form as uh, I don't find it available, you know, uh, find it as effective. It's more sedating. Um, so I don't, but we can find out and I can uh, share that with uh, you um, to share with the parents. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Hollander, in, re in relation to CBDV, is this only available through a clinical study? Um, that's correct. So CBDV, you know, it uh, is a compound that's been extracted from the plant and it has a IND and it's not available for use. Currently, it's only available if you participate in a clinical trial. Okay, great. Um, Dean, we have a couple of questions for you in regards to the phase two study. The first one was, for the nine adolescents that were in the phase two study that's been completed, how many of them continued into the open label, into the open label stage? Yeah, so there were nine in the double blind phase and eight of those individuals continued on into the first open label extension. And then, as I mentioned, there was a second open label extension uh, and it was five of those individuals um, continued on into the second open label extension. Okay, and could you um, perhaps go into a bit more detail? Um, the question here is in regards to the phase two study in adolescents at the 0.25 milligram dose. Um, could you clarify, you saw a difference in weight, but not in the hyperphagia scores. Could you perhaps go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I think the, the, the question probably, um, you know, is just pointing to the preliminary um, uh, data and, and, you know, small numbers of patients uh, are going to provide highly variable data. So body weight's an objective uh, measure. You know, somebody hops on the scales and they get their body weight measured. It's, it's kind of, that's what the number is. Um, but when it comes to hyperphagia, we're talking about caregiver reported, um, you know, uh, measures where there is potential for a lot of variability. So in small numbers, um, you're, you're less likely to find something significant in hyperphagia than you are in, in body weight. And uh, what we saw in body weight was that there was kind of a, an increase in body weight over the, the study period. And that's because these individuals are adolescents, so they're growing. Um, but once they were on the higher dose, that started to taper off and actually come back down. With the hyperphagia, uh, it was a little bit more messy. And so with the analysis that we performed, it, it was not clear that there was an overall reduction in all of the individuals in, in that, uh, at that higher dose. There was a request for Dr. Singh's information in the chat. So I posted that back up. This is for Dr. Teresa Jacob, who works with Dr. Singh. So if you're interested in that study, 
please reach out to them. This is gonna be the final question. This was in, um, for Guan Fasim. What were some of the more problematic side effects that a person might need to be concerned about? Okay, thank you for the question. So the most common side effect is uh, sleepiness. Uh, it takes about, uh, it's, uh, the, it takes four days for the medicine to achieve steady state. Uh, and during that time and up to a week, you might have uh, drowsiness extending into the daytime. Now, it's not the same kind of drowsiness that one experiences with, uh, say, a benzodiazepine like, um, like Xanax or anything like that. It doesn't suppress breathing either. But uh, that is the most common uh, issue. Um, some uh, other than that, it's really, really well tolerated. So uh, if there are other, um, yeah, it, I don't see that uh, to be any other, uh, any of the other issues don't seem to seem to be a recurring problem. I did want to answer the previous question and looked it up. It is available. The medicine is available in the UK as well under the same brand name, which is Intuniv, and that's Quantasine Extended Release. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session on our current PWS clinical trials. As you heard today, there are several PWS trials that need to be filled or will be upcoming. And we do hope that you will consider participating if you are eligible for these studies. Um, of course, after you have determined if it's right for you and your family. So please remember to join us later today to learn more about the recently completed study on carbitocin and tomorrow at 3 p.m. to learn more about the study completed by DCCR, or by Seleno looking at DCCR. FPWR relies on the generous support of our PWS community to accelerate PWS research in our search for future treatments and a cure for PWS. Over the past several years, we have made many advances in research that are leading to new treatments, but we have much work yet to do. We need your help to keep research moving forward, so please consider making a personal contribution to FPWR this year to help support the development of these new treatments for our loved ones. We will be back later today, and we hope that we'll see you soon. Have a great rest of your day.